Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. You're listening to Healthcare Matters, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to help you make sense of complex healthcare economics and policy issues. With us, as always, is the incomparable Dr. Robert Popovian, joining us from our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. He's a pharmacist, economist, and the chief science policy officer at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And joining me is my good friend, Connor Mertens in Seattle, my co-host and our patient advocate and community outreach manager, and an individual who today is contemplating what life will be all about without having their MVP quarterback now residing in Denver. I've given up all hope on the Seahawks. It's We're all in on the Mariners now. Denver can have them. They can have them. We're moving on. <laughs> so we're happy to be back for our third season, Connor. There's so much more we want to share with our audience, our patients, our advocates, our policymakers, everybody who listens to our podcast. And thank you for listening to us over these past few seasons and for all the supportive feedback. Now let's take a look at one of your comments. Henry writes, you guys do such a great job helping people like me understand complicated healthcare issues. Thanks so much. That's what it's all about, right, Robert? It's always great to hear from our listeners. That's without a doubt my favorite part of this podcast. So let's get into our next episode. Connor, what if I told you the number 2000? What does that mean to you? Well, now you got me thinking about the Mariners. That that was, you know, one of the, one of the last times we went to the playoffs. True, uh, that is a true case, and you know you should be proud of that. However, today we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, and the number two thousand has a very special meaning. So, Robert, today we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. Let's get into it. What is this uh, two thousand dollars talking about? How does that relate to the Inflation Reduction Act? So it's actually really good news for our seniors, right? So the $2,000 is a cap that was instituted in the Medicare Part D program. So for the first time, our seniors are going to have a cap of -of out-of-pocket cost expenditures for their drugs. Before this, there was no cap. There was unlimited exposure. And the $2,000 is the maximum that they will be liable for annually for their expenditures out of pocket. Well, here, you know, we like to talk about the good parts, the bad parts, then the ugly parts, maybe the parts that could be better about about healthcare policy and economics. So when it comes to the Inflation Reduction Act, it certainly sounds like there are some positive things for patients, but certainly some things that could be done better. This $2,000 cap, it sounds amazing for seniors. Can you tell us more about why this specifically helps seniors? It allows them to have certainty, right? Before this, when there was no cap, seniors would have unlimited exposure for out-of-pocket costs for their drugs. So similar to what we see in the commercial side, so the insurance plans that you and I have, Connor, for the first time in the Medicare Part D program, seniors have certainty. They will not be spending any more than $2,000 per year for their prescription drugs out of pocket. Which, you know, $2,000 still is nothing to shake our head at. That's certainly a burden financially for a lot of folks. But this is definitely, like you said, a step in the right direction and, and some finally some certainty about what seniors can expect in their health care benefits. What, what else can we say that the IRA has done that's, that's really helping folks? Well, for the immediate future, starting next year, seniors will not have any out-of-pocket costs for any of the vaccines that they receive through their Medicare Part D program. That is significant. We know when seniors have an out-of-pocket cost for their vaccines, there's a great deal of abandonment at the pharmacy level. So when they show up to the pharmacy to get their vaccines, and if there's an out-of-pocket cost associated with it, the seniors generally walk away. So having this law pass and now that has zero exposure to -to out-of-pocket costs for their vaccines. This is super important because as you well know, not only vaccines are the most cost beneficial intervention in the healthcare system, but they're very important for our elderly because as we've seen in the COVID pandemic, they were the ones that were most affected and the ones that the vaccine helped the most. And and not to just to mention that, it was disproportionately affecting, you know, ethnic and racial minorities and folks from low-income communities. So these changes in, in Medicare Part D for vaccines could be, you know, save some lives, so genuinely save some lives. That is true. Robert, a lot of the legislation uh, packed into the bill, this Inflation Reduction Act, are themes that we've discussed before, themes about transparency and passing along um, savings to patients. Can you tell us what this bill could do better? 
So that's a good question, right? Just like any other legislation, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. So the bad and the ugly parts are really that patients are still not going to get the savings procured on their behalf by the PBMs at the point of sale. So when they show up to a pharmacy and they have a coinsurance or a deductible, they will still have to pay those coinsurance or deductible based on the retail price of the medicine instead of the negotiated price that has been done on their behalf by the pharmacy benefit management company. In fact, the uh, federal government through this legislation had the opportunity to address this and they did not do so. And that's one of the biggest problems that I foresee that they didn't address. In addition, I would say the other disturbing part is that, as you well know, Connor, and Global Healthy Living Foundation has done a study on this, and we published it in the Health Science Journal. Annually, the number of drugs being excluded from national formularies has been increasing. And this was an opportunity for the federal government to address this issue. We know that a lot of times these exclusions are okay, you know, because their brand name is being excluded compared to a comparable generic. But in 50% of the cases, these exclusions are either therapeutic substitutions or in some cases, exclusions involve a generic medicine, which is substantially cheaper in favor of a brand drug. And that's where the seniors are going to get hurt because at the end of the day, as we discussed, they're still being exposed to the retail price of the medicines and not the negotiated price. And therefore, if a pharmacy benefit management company decides to exclude a generic in favor of a brand, when a patient shows up to the pharmacy and they have a coinsurance or a deductible, they have to pay it based on the full retail price. So Robert, currently there are hundreds of these medications that are excluded from national PBM formularies. Is there any sort of clinical or economic justification for it? Or is this just all trying to line some pockets? So that's a great question, Connor. So our study that we published through Global Healthy Living Foundation demonstrated that, as I mentioned, 50% of the time, it's actually justified from both an economic and a clinical perspective. Uh, 50% of the time, formularies are excluding drugs such as a brand name drug that has an equivalent generic in the marketplace, which is substantially cheaper. So it makes absolute sense. But it's the other 50% that is problematic because the other 50% involves excluding drugs that are not they don't have a generic equivalent. So it's sort of like they depend on a different molecule that they assume will have the same efficacy and safety profile for the patient. In other words, they're playing doctor through formularies because they're forcing physicians to make clinical judgments that may not be in the best choice for the patient. But in addition, there are cases, as I mentioned, that formularies exclude generic medicines, which is, again, substantially cheaper in favor of brand name medicines. And the sole purpose of that is to line the pockets of the PBMs by covering higher priced, higher rebated drugs. And this is the unfortunate part about the Inflation Reduction Act. We had an opportunity to address this issue legislatively and codify it in the law and make sure that this does not happen. And this was a miss, frankly. So clearly we could say that they could have done a little bit better there. Were there any pieces of this that you know stood out to you as just being plain bad policy? So, yes. And it has to do with impact on innovation. So Congressional Budget Office put out a report before the passage of the bill and the signage of the bill that, in fact, about 15 fewer drugs will be introduced into the market over the next 30 years because of the passage of this law. So a bipartisan group of analysts, which Congress depends upon, came up with this number. It's not a partisan issue. It's not a Republican or a Democrat number. Now, there are private entities that have done similar analysis using different assumptions. Because remember, Connor, these are all based on assumptions, correct? And they've done the analysis to show up to 60 drugs may not be introduced in the marketplace in the next 30 years. But the question is this, which drugs are not going to get introduced? And my fear is that the more uncertain disease areas where there's less certainty about the research are the ones that pharma companies are going to be pulling back from. So disease areas such as Alzheimer's, where we haven't had any effective therapies, disease areas that are not as well reimbursed are going to be the ones that are pulled back from. So that's the fear. It's not necessarily that the numbers are going to be exactly right, whether it's 15 or 60, we don't know. We know it's going to be impacted. But the bigger question is, which classes of medicines, which disease areas are going to be impacted? 
And in my opinion, what's going to happen is that pharmaceutical industry is going to pull back in areas of research that are less certain, such as Alzheimer's. All right, Robert, well, you get your red marker. What's um, something that you wish this bill did and, and was missing out on? What I wish the bill did, and going back to our part that was missing, is one, address the issue of formulary exclusions. And number two, to have patients benefit from the negotiated prices at the point of sale at the pharmacy. This is unbelievably unfair for patients. And this happens both in Medicare and the commercial insurance companies with commercial plans. When you and I show up to a physician's office or an optometrist or a dentist or a hospital even, when we have a coinsurance or a deductible, we pay those based on a negotiated price that's been done on our behalf by the insurance company. In case of pharmaceuticals, which is the only entity in the healthcare system, patients do not benefit from those negotiations. So when you and I show up to the pharmacy counter and we have a deductible or a coinsurance, whether we are a Medicare patient or a privately insured patient, we end up paying based on the full retail price of that drug, which as you and I have discussed in the past, is extremely inflated because all of the kickbacks and the rebates and the fees that have to go back into the system. Remember, on average, 50% of every dollar sold for pharmaceuticals in the U.S., 50%, so 50 cents out of every dollar, goes back to the supply chain, primarily to the pharmacy benefit management companies and the insurers, and they hoard that money instead of passing it back to the patient at the point of sale. And that's what I would have changed. Those two issues, which is formulary exclusions and the issue of not passing the savings at the point of sale to the patient are supremely important. And even outside of the Inflation Reduction Act, these are policies that we've been preaching for years, you know. And and so I truly think it's it's what you said. We really miss an opportunity, but unfortunately with the way and speed that federal legislation moves around healthcare, I almost feel kind of a take what I can get mentality. That is not a bad mentality to have. And in fact, our producer, Ben, mentioned it to me. Something that is, look, there are some good stuff in here. And absolutely, he's correct. Zeroing out the out-of-pocket costs for vaccines for seniors. Extremely important. Capping out-of-pocket costs at $2,000. Extremely important. Those are two huge wins for patients. Patients who are burdened with out-of-pocket costs and are unable to pay for them. Were there misses? Absolutely. Are there ugly parts of this legislation? Without a doubt. But as Ben always mentions to me, don't forget the good stuff. So Connor, you and I have to always remember the good stuff and talk about it. You know, we just like to break it down for our, for our patients. And, and like you said, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, we, uh, we want to make sure that you all are informed. Well, Robert, today I kind of figured out something that is very thematic with any legislation is that we kind of take the good with the bad, that it's never black and white, that we could always do better. And unfortunately, the one constant is is we're coming up short for patients. But as always, I want to make sure you get the last word. This isn't changing from the first two seasons. Connor, everything in healthcare comes with the good and the bad. But at the end of the day, at Global Healthy Living Foundation, And the work you do specially, because you work with patients every day, is for us to support patients. And as long as our North Star is the patient and the benefits that the patient can get, whether it's short-term, medium, or long-term, then that's a win for us. With this legislation, there are absolute wins for patients, but there are absolute misses as well. So what we need to do as an organization is what you need to do as an individual who communicates with their patients every day is to constantly go back and make sure those misses are addressed in future legislative efforts, whether it's in the federal level or in the state level. And that's the message that we need to carry. As always, thanks for breaking that down for us, Robert. I think that was some very valuable information for our listeners and and very topical. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you might be listening so you never miss an episode. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast, writing a positive review, and sharing with your friends and family. It'll help more people like you find us. And Connor, speaking of our listeners, you can also send us an email or audio clip to healthcarematters at ghlf.org. And you might be featured in one of our upcoming episodes. 
And before you go, make sure you take a listen to some of our other great podcasts on the GHLF Podcast Network. Yeah, that's a good point, Robert. Right now, I'm listening to Talking Head Pain with host Joe Co, and it's one of my must-listens. As a migraine patient and advocate himself, Joe does a fantastic job sharing what living with migraine is really all about. You can find all of GHLF's podcasts at ghlf.org slash listen. As always, he's Dr. Robert Popovian. And he's Connor Mertens, the individual who talks to the patients actually in our organization. We'll see you all next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.